and dive in. All right. I'm cool like this, man. You, yeah. I don't got to put a jacket on, right? All right. Cool. Nah, <laughs> this is not professional at all. I got a little t-shirt from a movie that I like on right now. I'm not like... The way that we do things with our space in the intercultural network, I think it's best for people to present how they do in real life. Like one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on um, was that I feel like you would really appeal to like our student population. Like we're all big on minority student engagement. So, you know, okay. we have people come through as they are, but without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hop into this now. We're like actually recording. I finally got my little sign off. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome, welcome, welcome to the first ever This Week in Black History segment here for the Intercultural Network. Uh, my guest here this week is the one and only Lance Wheeler. I met him actually on a trip with TCU called The Justice Journey in relation to him working with the Margaret Walker Center. However, I found out on that trip that day that we met, he was involved in one of my favorite museums ever, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. So, um, oh snap, did it freeze? Uh, man, it's internet, I swear. You good over there? Is I'm it good, you good? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, hopefully it saved my introduction for you. But Lance, I'm gonna go ahead and let you introduce yourself to the folks real quick and then we can- Oh, yo. So hello, my name is Lance Wheeler and I am, I'm from Georgia City, New Jersey. I lived in North Carolina, got to Mississippi. I've been in museums. Ooh, I've been doing museums since 2015. And I, my first museum gig really, before I even got to graduate school was I worked on a, uh, uh, in a, a exhibition called uh, Gifford County Slave Bees, right? So we looked at enslaved people um, in Gifford County, which is Greensboro, North Carolina. And then I had the privilege to work on a national exhibit dealing with uh, mass incarceration called Straits and Incarceration, where you had 20 universities participate actually in this uh, national exhibit. So I was at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, UNCG, and we focused on chain gangs in the 1920s. And so going through that period, I knew that I wanted to be a museum curator. And I also was working at the Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro. North Carolina. Uh, and so I knew that I wanted to work at a civil rights museum or an entity that was dealing with African American history, but I also knew that I wanted to work with people. Um, and so from there, I applied to the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, which is the first state civil rights museum in the country. And I became one of the first curators. I was a curator of, of exhibitions. I was there for a good two years. The first two years, not to toot my own horn, but most of the programs that were coming out of there were my programs. They're doing a program right now uh, on the 18th, which is their MLK Poetry Night, where we wanted to give the museum, the idea behind the program was to give the, the museum space to the people through, uh, through art, whether it was visual, whether it was, whether it was spoken word. And so they're doing that this year, this should be their third year. And now I'm, uh, I'm at Jackson State University, which is at HBCU. And I'm the Education Public Relations Manager for the Margaret Walker Center uh, and Copal Civil Rights Education Center. Margaret Walker it was a famous uh, intellect, Black woman. Um, I tell people she's your favorite office author. So she was the mentee, mentor, excuse me, of um, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, uh, Alice Walker. Um, all the big people you can think of, she was their mentor. And then she was the mentee of Richard Wright, uh, Langston Hughes. So she's coming from that era of blackness. And then COFO stands for Council of Federated Organizations. And it's uniquely found in Mississippi dealing with the civil rights movement. So think of COFO as SNCC, CORE, or even like the NAACP, but it once again, it's only found uniquely in Mississippi. I have two history degrees. Um, I'm a dad, uh, which is great, which is the greatest thing I could ever be, I tell people. And um, I love museums, but I love history, but I tell people history is boring. Yeah. History doesn't become fun until you find yourself into the narrative. And usually, unfortunately, for a lot of people, that's not until you get to college and you can pick your courses, right? Or yeah. you get on a tour or a trip. But uh, I really think history should be conversational. So my goal, 
honestly is to hurt people's feelings so we can have a real conversation about what's happening in the real world. Yeah. And I, man, I swear, you just talented with these words out here. Like even from that first moment that we had met, um, you I like that part you were putting at the end where you're talking about like I like to hurt people's feelings with words. Like you had asked <laughs> us, what's the official name of uh, Mississippi State? And like me brain off and I even realized oh miss and you're like nope that's conditioning and I was like whoa I never even looked at it like that because that's the way that they branded themselves for what mm -hmm. centuries now dare I say so yeah mm -hmm. definitely definitely it's just the little things I tell people you know it's the little things that is it's it's history still matters and I think these this these horrific events this summer even what's going on right now in this country with the whole capital we can learn from it but we also have to figure out how to move forward, right? Yep. I and mean, that's the most important piece. Um, and 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 I tell people it's difficult, like you know, being black and studying civil rights and being at a civil rights institution, uh, or being black, period, doing this kind of work, it's difficult. It's not easy. But um, it's through conversations like this that we're having, or even my kid is the, is what keeps me going. So. Yep. Well, yeah, dude, always killing it. But yeah, really thankful to have you, Lance. So the whole goal of this show, for those who are getting ready to watch this, we're recording this here on what, January the 15th, but this is going to be released the first week of February, is to shed a little bit of light for y'all on some specific events that happened in Black history. Lance is thankfully accepting the honor of being my first guest, so we're going to hop into his event from the first week of February, and I'm gonna let Lance take it away and we'll dive into discussion from there. Well, the Margaret Walker Center this year, um, we just had one of our first events last night, right? And it's technically not February, but it's the top of the year. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware that the Freedom Rides, the anniversary is this, this summer, uh, May 4th is gonna be 60 years. And so we actually had Dave Dennis Sr., or a lot of people just call him David, but we call him Dave Dennis. He is, was actually part of COFO. And so we had a whole conversation last night with him, his son, um, and Dr. Doris Derby. And it was really called a movement past to present. And so connecting the dots from the 60s movement into what's happening right now in the Black Lives Matter movement. And so one of the things that I got from the conversation, I want people to understand from the conversation, whether you are a protester or activist, you, you don't have to, but I'm sure a lot of people now are trying to find how can they be involved in a movement without actually being physically on the street. And I think it's important for them to note that you are an activist in any way you show up at work, particularly if you're black, brown, and indigenous, right? So yes, you use, for example, Dave Dennis Jr. said he's not an activist, but he, he's a professor at Morehouse. He teaches social social justice and he's a journalist, right? And I told him, I said, well, you have to change your way of thinking because you putting pen to paper is activism in itself, right? Because right. Trayvon Martin can no longer speak for himself. Right. You know, Breonna Taylor can no longer speak for themselves. But you putting their names on paper and writing and, and speaking for them, you are forming to activism. Now, the Margaret Walker Center in February, we are, we have a couple of exhibits coming up. Uh, we have a, a exhibit open up by Dr. Doris Derby um at the shootings that took place on on jazz state campus by white police officers right, right. um this is 19 1970 right and so let me paint the picture for you You have black students on the hbcu you have civil rights that's happening across in the 60s you have Edgar ever just got assassinated you had jfk being assassinated you have the tensions of, of it's going to be are we going to continue this path of nonviolence? Are we going to move in a black power uh, uh, direction? And so you just have white officers that march onto this black campus in the middle of the night and shoot, shoot, start shooting. Yeah. They kill two young men. Uh, they kill two young men. And so we're celebrating that anniversary this uh, February as well. We also are going to do be doing a book series as well. But for me, this is the most time, the busiest year that I, is between January and February that I get busy. I, I'm usually speaking for Kellogg. Um, I'm doing some speaking engagements next week for some students. How do Jewish people, how does the Jewish community fit in civil rights where there's a long relationship 
where a lot of sometimes when people just think, okay, there's not relations between the Jewish community and the black community, which is not actually true. Right. Uh, it goes way back, right? The first part of the NAACP was founded by a Jewish man, co-founder, right? And he's also the president for a long period of time. So there's a huge relationship of that happening. Um, what else? What else is going on in February for the Margaret Walker Center Coco? Well, right now we're doing a lot of virtual programs as well, but the main goal for the both centers, we are trying to come up with a COVID plan. How do we get people physically back into the buildings? Um, so most of our conversations are going to be virtual, like I said, and I just named a few, our exhibit, uh, a commemoration, commemoration of what's going to be happening soon with the Freedom Riders, Doors Derby exhibit, and that's really chunk of February. We haven't really mapped out the whole month of February, but it's a lot of partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, having visited both of your centers and even the Civil Rights Museum, I think it, it's it's wild to me, like the extensive work that goes into preserving the different things that y'all do. And like one of the things that really took me uh, like back almost when I went to the Kofo Center was that like y'all really tried to recreate it as it was or as close as possible while still, you know, putting the infographics and all that good stuff up, having space to air films where possible and presenting this stuff orally. Could you talk to the people a little bit about what the work is in protecting the integrity or like relevance to the era almost when it comes to that, but like modernize it for presentation? So particularly Kofo in the Margaret Walker Center, they are considered historical landmarks, right? Mm -hmm. And so legally, there's only so much you can do to the physical building, right? You can't really tack on another part of the, to add on to the building. Right. But as long as the structure is maintained, you can really do a lot within the physical building. And so for, yes, use Kofa example, um, and I wasn't on the project for Kofa. Kofa has been around for a few years and I just, I just got there. But Kofa, for example, when you first walk in, you can tell some things did change, right? The middle of it used to be a, like a lounge. And when you go to the right-hand side, that was the actual, actual, actual physical building of Kofo. And we try to emulate that as much as we can. Um, but unfortunately during the time, you know, a lot of people don't keep those things. And so a lot of the stuff that's in that building is actually replicas. Some of the original stuff is gonna be put in archives, which is the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Uh, but because of that space, those are all replicas. And so we try to, most, most museums, the smaller museums, I should say, if they have a, a large uh, collection, they're gonna try to get stuff fabricated or uh, um, extra things. For example, I know when I was museum, if we had a, a bunch of uh, Kofo buttons, quote unquote, I said we had like a hundred, about 10 of those we would actually take out and let people physically handle. Right, because there's only so many books in the collection. Uh, and so also then creating experience to that. Through the Civil Rights Museum, being the curator of exhibition there, and some of the stuff was in place, our goal was to, how much of the physical things can we let people actually touch or interact with, or give them an idea? Because I tell people when you interpret history, you don't remember facts, you remember experiences, you remember moments. And so, yes, use Gallery 2, which is um, Mississippi Black and White. And when you're going through the lynching monoliths, right, and the moment you walk in that carpet, you're going to hear somebody say, boy, get off that sidewalk. Yeah. Girl, you know better than that. So to create that moment, that experience of you being in the Jim Crow South, right, we can't... <laughs> We can't replicate that, but things like that are happening right now in this country, that, right? But we can try to get you close and make you feel uncomfortable as much as we can to make you physically understand that. And I'm sure if you remember when you were in gallery two, there were images of people being lynched and the pictures were slightly tilted. And I tell people normally when you go through that and no one's talking to you, you don't know that the idea is for you to tilt your head like you're being hung from a tree. Right, and so creating those moments so that is a deeper conversation in itself. Like, okay, I may have never been lynched, I can never lose, really I, I, I understand that experience, but me going through that, I can have that conversation with somebody, black or white or young. You get what I'm saying? So, it's a lot of thinking behind in a design of a museum, 
but also when you have a historical site like Kofo, the structure, the integrity of the structure, but also didn't interpret that space, right? Yeah. Those are big things that those are conversations all the time in museum spaces, but it's the job of the interpreter, but it's also the job of the to text and some of the visual aids to make that space come alive and try to transport you there. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was trying to hold off on it because there's just so much to talk about, but I think we can go ahead and dive into it. You've spoken about a little bit of all the attention to detail put into the Civil Rights Museum in Mississippi. Um, and there's like so much just little stuff that like, if you just walk through unguided, like you say, you'll never notice it. Like I went there in 2019 for the first time and I passed through and never saw the room um, where it did the little video on Meg Revers. And having like having been there with you getting the guided tour, you explain the significance of the gun and like having building a rapport with his daughter and still keeping communication with her and talking about like the work of talking with them and stuff like that, about how to tastefully present the history and info. So like, I don't know, man, there's so much I could ask you about it almost. I'm, give the people what you can about the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and I'll try to jump in here and there and ask questions. I thought it was my it, it was my dream job, right? To be able to say, I graduated 2017, so I was what, 26 at the time. 26, yeah, I was 26 at the time. And having the privilege to build a museum is something that you don't ever really have. Not often a lot of professionals get to have the opportunity. Right. But to be 26, that they have a say in that, right? They say, well, that date's wrong. That needs to look like this. I think we should put that there to engage the visitors this way. And then have the opportunity to meet civil rights veterans that we've, that we've read about my our entire lives, like Bob Moses, Miss Merle Evers, you know, who is the daughter, who's the mother of Rena? Rena Evers is like my aunt. I call her auntie. We call, we talk all the time. Um, having the privilege to meet um, John, uh, excuse me, Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet those people at the age of 26 to say, yo, and they're telling you, okay, this is what you need to do to keep this movement moving, right? This is your response. So carrying those that weight, um, but it, it's, it's nothing like it. And like you said, I, I'm a, most of the time when you go to a museum, you don't see the curator at all, right? The curator is supposed to be in his office, boom, that's not me. My job for me is to how we engage with this, this history. And so, I find it important if you, whoever you are, uh, if you are in museums, if you're studying history, if you're studying English, if you're, I think it's important to understand your craft and build that rapport with the people in your in, in your field. And so I purposely went to the Delta, right? I purposely watched the sunset in the Delta. I purposely went to Muddy, Mississippi. I wanted, I can talk about these places in the museum, but if I don't experience it there, if experience and I don't go through that moment, how can I tell people that history, right? Right. Uh, a lot of times as a historian, we are told to keep our biases out of it. The first time you see me in the museum, you see my blackness, right? And I can't just always separate my blackness. So when you come to my museum, I'm not talking to you as a historian. I'm talking to you, Lance, a kid from Jersey who loves history. And my goal, once again, is try to make, make you cry. And let's get to the nitty gritty of these conversations. Um, and so particularly with the gun, I, I walk y'all through it and, and y'all physically can't see, but hopefully y'all look it up. Um, we at the Civil Rights Museum actually had the rifle that was used to assassinate Negro Evers in 1963. And so I had the privilege to hold it. Um, I tell people it's heavier than what you think it is. Um, I personally feel like that's because it took a man's life. Um, I've had the privilege to be in the room with Rena looked at it and cried and broke down and 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 talked to it and said um came in the room quiet just a spotlight on the gun and she said you know you took everything away from me you took my father away from me you took my best friend away from me. you took my hero away from me you're just a weapon made to kill animals but you took a man's life right you don't understand what you did to me. And my father has taught me not to hate, but I cannot hate you. 
And she looked at it and said, and got real close to it, just like, just like this. If I touch you, I break you and I hate you. And she left. And so creating those moments for those people in museums, because I tell people, particularly the civil rights, those people are still alive. Those people have to go through that every single time. Like I said, Rena and I are really close. I hear the trauma in her voice every day. I see how it's a struggle to do the work and carry the legacy of both our parents. Her parents are phenomenal, right? She didn't choose to that life. It chose her. Right. And so that's part of what I try to do is try to get people engaged that way. Because once you think about it that way, you like, damn, that's not just an object behind a glass. Mm -hmm. It's a living, breathing thing because people are constantly talking about it, which I was constantly talking about. It, and there are people constantly living those moments. So that's a tidbit of how I interpret history. Um, I know when I also talk about lynchings, for example, we say hanging. I tell people, think about it deeper. It's no due process of law. People still get lynched today. Yeah. Trayvon, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud, George Floyd, right? With the list goes on, they never had due process, right? And so if you if you if you do it that way, there's a aha moment for people. Damn, you're right. Uh same thing with the, with the Confederate flag, right? I tell when I used to tell people, okay, we're always gonna make it about black and white. Let's let's try to take the black and white out of it. And I I used to tell people, okay, um, what does that flag symbolize to you? Well, heritage, blah, 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 okay. Let's look at it this way. If, we're, if you're in the United States and you say you wanna leave the United States, that symbolizes treason. Plain and simple, right? We know what, what the definition of treason is, but you still fly that symbol of treason. So can you really say you're for America if you wanted, you, you wanted to leave America? And so I've done that to a lot of people in the museum, right? Try to make them physically think and just, and then occasionally I'll bring a guest in and have them talk to them, right? Like Rena Evers or something like that. But I think that's what that space allows, that's what that space does. Um, and I, other museums do that, like the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, the Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta, the Civil Rights Museum in Greensboro. Uh, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, people known as the Lynching Museum, right? You got the Charleston Museum, uh, IAM, which is the African American Museum that's going to open up in Charleston. There's a bunch of museums that are doing that kind of work. What right. um, I think I think I should highlight really quickly, and then of course I can't forget the big one. You got the National in DC. Yeah, I mean, but I also think one thing, and I haven't had the pleasure of going to all of those. I did get to go to the Legacy, or not the Legacy Museum, um, what you call it, the EJI Museum, and that's that's an experience in and of itself. But even with that, I feel like that is displays, like you said, and stuff on lynching, incarceration and stuff like that. Like you get to feel like some real things. Like one of the pleasures I had with the last trip that I went on, we got to see some of the places that they were talking about in Mississippi before heading to the museum. And that's not something that I had going into it. Like we toured the Evers home and that made that story that much more real because when you look at that big sturdy refrigerator and realize that that went through a man and went through a house and went through the wall and hit the refrigerator and dented the refrigerator. And his blood is still in the driveway from 1963. People right. forget that. People go into, oh, those are just rough spots. No, that's that man's blood in that driveway. And, and so think about it every time that when Rena goes home, mm -hmm. you know, and she still calls it her house. She lives, she relives that moment every day. Right. And so that's why I tell people, that's why I tell people about the gun that way. So because when you do go, because sometimes, like you said, you have the proof to go to the Everest house first. Sometimes we go to the Civil Rights Museum and I said, well, then your next stop is the Everest house. That's where you should go. And it's the Merle, Megar and Merle Everest home, the national monument now, because it's a national monument. Right. Yeah. And that was just real recent that it got that classification, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And like, it's, we know the big stories. Like, I've been hearing about Medgar Evers my whole life, basically, because I had grandparents who were born in the 20s and 30s, respectively. Like, they made sure that we knew these names and stuff like that growing up. But even little ones I'd never heard of. Like, you told me the story of Vernon Damer, and that was one that 
it, it still blows my mind to this day that even on his deathbed, he was still fighting the cause of making sure people get registered to vote and things like that. I did a video uh, with my office not long ago where I ended up telling his story as to why the importance, like what that is the importance of, of voting for me and stuff like that. And I feel just so much like one of the things that I always tell people is that we treat the civil rights era, quote unquote, like it was so long ago, but I'm like, Ruby Bridges is, is a professor. Sorry, Dr. Bridges is like is a professor out here now. Like th this is not just some little girl in a Norman Rockwell painting. This is a real human being and like things that you don't even think of when it comes to history. I always tell people this to like bring this into context. I'm from New Orleans originally. That's obviously where Dr. Bridges went to school at his famous painting and all that. I never went to school with a white person. My older brother who's in his thirties never went to school with a white person. My mom never went to school with a white person. That's three generations of people basically all graduating in different eras. That is something in history. We experience life as a result of that moment. Like New Orleans having all these private schools and like separated things like that are solely, it was born within that moment right there. And we were still feeling ripple, ripple effects to that. As a matter of fact, thinking about it that way, it was still so segregated obviously de jure instead of de facto um that i hadn't even met a white kid before moving to the state of texas so like mm -hmm. i i love the work that y'all are doing to contextualize history as these people are still alive they're still walking around talk to them if you can because i feel like that is the important work that needs to be done at this juncture and let me tell you that i think it's important for people to realize the dr kings the rosa parks the Malcolm. Malcolm X, even though the civil rights leader tried to exclude him, the mega Evers, those are phenomenal people. But I, 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 think, I think what people forget to really think about is the everyday person is really the heroes and sheroes. They resisted Jim Crow every day. They faced Jim Crow every day. And so it's important to read about those big figures, but it's important to sit down with your grandma. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important to sit down with your grandfather while you can or your great great whoever and say who am, who are we who am i as a person um because we seek we as black people some of us don't have the luxury to go past uh uh the civil war right mm -hmm. and but we're able to have that conversation like how grandma like how are you how are you involved in the movement who are you and i oh grandpa who are you and i think and sometimes it makes them feel good that you're asking those deeper questions, right? And sometimes it's something they may not want to talk about. And you have to respect that. But then you can rephrase that question, like, who are you as a man? Who are you as a woman? Because ultimately, by, by you telling me that, giving me that those definitions, ultimately describes who I am as a man or a woman to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think that's the important niche. It's the everyday person that resisted the system called Jim Crow. Um, and Jim Crow wasn't just in the South. I like to tell people that, you know, predominantly we have to think, well, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, it's, it's terrible. No, nah, it, it, it was bad all over. All, all 50 states for black people and brown people, indigenous people of color. You know, you have to dig deeper, you know. Uh, but I just wanted to say that I think you made a valid point, but I, I also want to touch upon know who you are by asking your neighbor, asking your grandmother who you are, which the, what did you go through? Um, because they resisted too. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Um, before we go ahead and wrap up here, is there anything you want to add to the people, Lance, as far as words of wisdom? We're going to have you plug everything you involved in again before we hop off, but what's something that you can give the folks, whether that be on history, activism, or something just sitting on your heart right now? Um, I, I was having this conversation with Rena, Rena the other night and I had and I, I proposed this question uh, to the panel that I hosted last night and I'm going to propose the same question if, I'm, if my word document opens up and, it's, and I just really want y'all to really think about it because I don't, I don't know I'm going through this process myself uh, to be transparent it's been I haven't been able to sleep since March of last year right good because what's been going on in the country with black people. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out ways, how do I get involved in my own way? And I figured that's through my work and creating spaces for black people to vent, but then also uplift them. But the question I, I it's a statement, then it's a question. And that's when you think about civil rights, 
past and now. And the question is the common the common thread is the common thread is the fight for equality, and the common pain is trauma. So I'm gonna read that again, right? The common thread is the fight for equality, and the common pain is trauma. How can we make time to find healing, peace, joy in the midst of ongoing systematic trauma? We as Black people carry a lot of trauma, right? Whether it is that whether we know it or not, it is physiologically in our body, right? We carry that trauma. So you as Black and Brown people find ways to heal, right? And so once again, the common thread is the fight for equality and the common pain is trauma. What are you doing to heal? And that's what I'm gonna leave out with. Wow, powerful. Lance, go ahead and give the people what you're working on, some things you wanna plug and all that, and we can go ahead and get on out of here. Well, I just opened up, I just started my own LLC. Um, called Museum Black BLK. Um, it's really connecting with museums, of course, but I tell people I'm not, I'm not just a muse museum professional or practitioner. I do a lot of creative stuff. I work with all types of creatives. And so it's really, my niche is addressing trauma. My niche is civil rights and human rights. My niche is community building. Um, so that I, start, I just started doing that. Uh, I've worked with some food justice advocates right here in Mississippi, um, to black farmers, to indigenous people, the Choctaw here from the from the coast of Mississippi. Uh, I've done a couple conversations for Kellogg. I have a racial healing piece coming out on the 19th for Kellogg. Um, I am, I'm just trying to get to a point in my career where I want to be leading. Uh, but then when in leading, I want to start uh, molding and uh, uh, br bridging the gap for young black museum professionals in the field and get to, to get to the table. Um, I tell people my next job, my next career goal is to train people to either take my job or leave to go get a better job. Mm. Um, and I just want to continue that legacy of black professionals in this field. And if any black, and this, this is not me excluding black women, because black women are doing the thing in the museum field, but it's, it's, it's hard to find black males in this museum field. Everybody, please get my information, find me, let's talk, let's get you in this field. And also, if you're a black woman, you just want to get in the field too, let me know. Um, but those are the things that I'm working on, right? You know, I got to, hopefully there's a fellowship out there I apply to. Hopefully I get it next week. Um, but I'm really just chilling, man. I'm trying to find ways to breathe. I'll be 30 in March. I tell, <laughs> I tell people my 30s is about me. My 20s are about a lot of other people. My 30s are going to be about me finding ways to breathe um, with the midst of chaos. Yeah, I get so. that. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you again, sir. Everybody, as always, um, we are the Intercultural Network. We're here trying to support our students at Tarrant County College, doing what we can by having great folks like the one and only Lance Wheeler on with us. As always, I've been your host, Mary Tobin, drink water and respect women, and we out. All right, let me stop.